the deep dive. All right, let's take a deeper dive. Um, I'm going to be talking about this stuff in more detail, getting a little sciencey here, although not as technical as a chemistry class. pH. Okay, now that we know a little bit about the pH scale, what the numbers mean, acidic versus basic, all that stuff, let me explain about how these factors actually affect our livestock, why it's important to manage our pH, and what kind of swings our livestock can tolerate. So pH stands for power of hydrogen. And basically, the more hydrogen ions there are in the water, the more acidic the water is. The more hydroxide ions, the more basic the water is. So ions are essentially just atoms or molecules that have gained a charge by either losing or gaining an electron. So that's the whole part. The ion part is being charged through the electron. You lose an electron, you become positive. You gain an electron, you become negative. And the resulting ions being charged, they have this tendency to want to bond with other molecules or atoms that are around them. And so on a small scale, a few atoms or molecules, it's not really a big deal. But on a large scale, when all this bonding occurs, that basically these ions are degrading whatever they're bonding to. So acids have the tendency to want to bond with minerals. That's why we use a lot of acid-based cleaning products to clean oxidized surfaces or mineral stains, stuff like that. You think about like if you had a mineral deposit on your fish tank, you would use hydrogen peroxide or vinegar to kind of loosen up that debris so you could scrape or scratch it off. Hydroxide ions, unlike the hydrogen ions that are attracted to minerals, are attracted to uh, fats and proteins and lipids, that sort of stuff, because they have a negative charge. Unlike the positive hydrogen ions, hydroxide ions gain an electron to become negative these ions tend to be more attracted to fats, lipids, oil, proteins, that sort of stuff. That's what they want to bond to. And that's why really basic elements like bleach with a pH of 13 is used for cleaning up kitchen, like grease stains and oils, fats, stuff like that. Where you think about it in terms of an aquarium, once you start reaching a high pH, above 9, maybe closer to 10, what happens is the hydroxide ions start to denature components of the fish like their mucous membrane, uh, slime coats, parts of their gills, stuff on the outside first, you know, um, and even in really extreme cases can start to corrode like scales and exoskeletons, but that's got to be real, real hot in pH. Another negative to having high pH is that the less harmful ammonium is converted in higher concentration to the more harmful ammonia. In lower pHs, it's less harmful. In higher pHs, it's far more toxic. So if you have a cycle tank, theoretically, this shouldn't even be an issue, right? You don't see ammonia in a healthy cycle tank. But if you do get a little spike in a high pH range, it's going to be far more lethal than in a low pH. Low pH, on the other hand, it's nitrites that are very harmful. So again, if your tank cycled, shouldn't be an issue. But if you're cycling your tank, it's going to take a lot longer to cycle in a really low pH. And I'm not talking about a pH 6. I'm probably talking more like 5 or around there, maybe even a little lower, which is pretty far out of the norm for most people. But something to consider, if you're using CO2, you're blasting your tank during the cycling phase because you're like, hey, there's no fish in here, it doesn't matter. That's gonna slow your cycle down. So be cautious of that and blasting it to that degree, the trade-off for the plants really isn't that beneficial anyways. There's so, so much CO2 that they can use. Outside of the cycling phase, a really low pH is harmful because it basically causes acid burns. You know, the gills are going to be the first part of the fish to fry. And then 
if it gets really bad, you can fry the whole fish. I don't know if you've ever experienced an acid burn, but I got some acid on my arm once and it left a welt and scar. It was really horrible pain. So acid burns are serious. They can hurt your fish and it's not a pleasant conditions for them to live in. Even though it's generally best to try and replicate the water parameters that our fish come from in the wild, there is a lot of give or take when it comes to keeping them in an aquarium. Truthfully, a lot of fish have the ability to live outside of their natural pH range and live a completely healthy life. If you've made it this far in the video, I'm assuming you're watching other fish YouTubes. Think about people like Indy Fish Tanks, Father Fish, or Ohio Fish Rescue. Like, they're mixing and matching fish from all parts of the world with different pH requirements, and they all do really fine living their best lives. The general rule of thumb, though, is that most fish can live a really healthy life between a pH of 6 and 7.5, maybe 8 for some of the more basic fish. And they can even tolerate ranges of like maybe 5 or 4.5 up to 9, maybe 9.5 for brief periods. But personally, I would never put them into that situation even for a brief period. And even though we like to keep our aquariums as stable as possible. Truth of the matter is it's really normal that we see swings from between 6 and 7.5 and that's really not bad for the overwhelming majority of fish. Also keep in mind that when we're teetering around the neutral zone of 7, you know, 6 to 7.5, that difference is really minor compared to the difference between, you know, 5 and 6 or four and five, that would be huge. Also, if you're keeping a planted tank, there are daily cyclical fluctuations with regards to pH. So basically, during the day, plants consume CO2 and they put out oxygen, so the CO2 is acidic. They're getting rid of that. They're putting out oxygen, which is basic. And then at night, they're consuming oxygen and they're putting CO2 back into the water the lights are out, they can't photosynthesize, they're respiring like the fish and like us. Even though most fish are okay with this kind of cycle, uh, it can even occur in ponds in the wild, less likely to happen in flowing bodies of water like creeks and rivers and stuff. But most fish are okay. There are always exceptions. There are always super sensitive species out there. So I'm not giving you the go ahead to do all willy nilly, whatever you want with your pH. Look into it a little bit. Make sure you don't have really sensitive species. Another way you can go about it, if you don't want to deal with the really sensitive ones, just ask people at your local fish store for hardy ones. Another daily fluctuation that might occur is if you're using CO2 in your planted tank. So that CO2 is going to be dropping the pH. And how that works is once carbon dioxide contacts water, it reacts and becomes carbonic acid. And so that lowers the pH. It's an acid. Something that I've heard discussed on more than one occasion and I've read about, but I'm not a hundred percent sure on, is that pH swings caused by CO2 or carbonic acid are not, not really that stressful for our fish, not stressful at all. Something that some people don't even worry about. I've heard of like successful aquarium keepers that lower their pH to around five when they're maxed out their CO2 in the middle of the day. And personally, that's not something I would go towards, but I do think it's important touching on the fact that pH swings associated with CO2 are not nearly as harmful as pH swings associated with low mineral content. And at that point, we're not really even concerned with the pH swing. The pH swing is merely the sign, the symptom of the low minerals. So we talked about the minerals, how they buffer acids in the water. They're also important for maintaining healthy fish life. So the minerals before I mentioned, those are necessary for forming fish bones and teeth and shrimp exoskeletons, that kind of stuff. But they're also important for some internal functions within fish, like 
maintaining gill functions and regulating osmotic pressure. And so when I talk about regulating osmotic pressure, that's really just like kind of a bunch of little levy systems inside of the fish. So um, the fish need to change the type of water that they can absorb or excrete as the water around them changes. Maybe um, something upstream has washed more minerals or salt into the area for the day. And so they need to regulate themselves. You know, you think about us, like you put your body in a bathtub and it gets all wrinkly. That's because as humans, we're not really good at regulating the difference between <clears throat> the water in us and the water solution around us. It kind of messes with our body. Fish are masters at this, but in order to operate those levy systems, the osmotic pressure, they need to have magnesium and calcium ions. Those are really important in regulating those processes. Plants. All right, let's talk a little bit about plants. I'm not as worried about plants and haven't done as much research through the years because I don't care as much if plants die. Um, I don't think they feel pain like fish and I don't have that sense of obligation. Regardless, you don't want to be throwing your money away and it's wasteful to just toss plants out. So basically plants tend to do better in softer, more acidic conditions. That being said, regardless of the conditions, if you provide your plants with some soil and light, most of them will do good. Add in some fertilizer, they'll do even better. And then some CO2, you can keep pretty much any plant you want in most conditions. It's really just those very sensitive species that we're talking about. If you're kind of shooting for like a high-end planted tank or, uh, you know, like a high-tech planted tank, I guess, where you're keeping all the reds and pinks and different colors and um, that sort of stuff. So for those really sensitive species, why does it matter? What is it with the soft and acidic water? Well, hard water is packed with all these minerals and the minerals can tend to clog the soil, their roots up a little bit, and that prevents nutrient uptake from happening. And the, the minerals can even kind of clog up the pores on the leaves, which prevent uh, gas exchange, you know, like CO2 going in and oxygen going out, which is good for your fish, and then also nutrient absorption. So the reason that a low pH is beneficial for aquatic plants and terrestrial plants for that matter is that it helps to dissolve the organic nutrients that the plants need into the water or the soil so that they can uptake them better. Now, not all of the nutrients that plants need are organic. You know, there's some more mineral-based ones that we've been talking about, calcium, magnesium, molybdenum, and those actually absorb better at slightly high pHs. So pretty much no matter what you do, um, it's never gonna be right. No, I'm just kidding. Um, better to stick with a slightly softer pH if you can, but molybdenum, calcium, magnesium, those will all still get absorbed, maybe just at a lower rate than it would otherwise. Again, most plants are pretty hardy. Give them some nutrition, some light, and they'll thrive. Throw in some CO2, you can grow whatever you want. But even with that, even my high tech tank, once in a while there's a plant that just doesn't work. And honestly, I don't stress about it. There's plenty of other ones to pick from. All right, I hope you've enjoyed listening to me ramble on about pH, GH, and KH today. <clears throat> I know it's kind of a boring topic, but it's one that a lot of people struggle with. So I hope this conversation was helpful for you. If you did find it helpful, please hit that like button, subscribe, leave a comment, put a lot of time and effort into creating educational videos like this. Until next time, see ya!